So with single deaths, the key size is effectively 56 bits, so a brute force attack is possible. So since we have a lot of, uh, or at that time, there's a lot of software and hardware invested in implementations of deaths, the idea, one idea is to use double deaths. Encrypt twice, but each time you encrypt using single deaths, use a different key. So we'd think that that, well, that doubles the key size. So now the key size is effectively 112 bits. So a brute force attack is on the order of 2 to the power of 112 operations, which is much more stronger. But there's a weakness, and the weakness comes from the meat in the middle attack. And we tried to go through an example not on deaths and double deaths, but on our example cipher. So we had an example cipher, just a small block cipher with just five bit blocks and we used a three bit key and we said that with a single version of that cipher, ABC, normally it takes a three bit key, so a brute force attack takes two to the power of three operations. The double version of that cipher, what we do is we encrypt using that cipher, the plain text, using K1, so there are two to the power of three possible values of K1, and then we encrypt the output of that first encryption again using the same cipher using a, another key K2. So in effect, using the double version of this cipher ABC means a brute force attack requires two to the power of two times three. Okay. 2 to the power of, and the exponent is 2 times the number of bits of the single uh, cipher key. So 2 to the power of 2 times 3, or 2 to the power of 6 operations. So that the equivalent, we think, with deaths, single deaths, 2 to the power of 56, double deaths, 2 to the power of 112 for a brute force attack. But the meat in the middle attack makes it simpler against the double version. So we went through the case, and the, the steps we went through were Given that the attacker knew a plaintext ciphertext pair, P1, C1, so here's a known plaintext attack. The attacker knows more than just existing ciphertext. They also know at least one pair, and typically they need to know two pairs, of plaintext ciphertext. So P1 and C1 are known by the attacker. And what they do, the steps of the attack, is that they take P1 the known plain text, and they encrypt it using all possible values of K1. In our simple version, it was all eight keys, three-bit key. We try and encrypt P1 using each value of K1, and that's what we come up with these eight values of output here, these X values, which is just from the encryption. Then the second step of the attack is that we take this corresponding ciphertext, C1. And we take that ciphertext and decrypt with the eight possible values of the key K2. So going backwards, really. And we get another eight X values. And it must be, if we've got the correct key, that is the correct values of K1 and K2, it must be that the value that's output from encrypting P1, one of those X values, matches one of the X values obtained from encrypting or from decrypting C1. And in fact, in our example, we found three matching pairs, which told us that there are three possible values of K1 and K2, the ones which lead to those matching pairs. And we ended up with those three possible values. Now, the attacker needs to select which of those three is the correct one. And we need more information to do that. So the attacker actually needed to know, in this case, a second pair of plain text ciphertext, P2, C2. And all we do is we can check of those three values, three potential keys, these three, check whether they work for our second pair of plain text ciphertext. And we check through them. We did them quite quickly at the end of the lecture, and we found that the first one works. The other two don't work. Don't work in terms of if we encrypt 11001 with, say, K1011, take the output, 
and then encrypt it with K2111, we do not get the corresponding ciphertext that tells us that that potential key pair is wrong. And as a result, the attacker finds the values of K1 and K2, or the six-bit key. So let's go back and just uh, summarize the concepts and, and apply them to real deaths. But one thing that maybe is not clear to people is why do we get these x values? Why are they the same? Well, it's easy to check by seeing what the normal user would have done to obtain the ciphertext. And I will not waste too much time with, uh, with looking up our table. I think you have it in front of you, the one with uh, the encryption. But if you look at what the normal user would have done to obtain the, the ciphertext, with P1, we had, I've done it before, so we had a value of 01101. And the, the normal user, the one that did the encryption, knows the key. And they know that K1 is 0, 0, 001. And when we encrypt P1 with K1, we get some x value, some intermediate value. I just not label it x so we can refer to it. And if you look up your table, you'll see the value is 0, 0, 001. 1, 1. And then, with the double version of our cipher, we take that x value, that value, and we apply the second key, k2, which in our case was 100. Zero, zero. And again, you get the output from the table. So you look up, and you, if you look up those rows, you'll find the output ciphertext 11111. That's how P1 and C1 were obtained by the normal user. Now, let's try the other way. Let's say that this was the encryption. What about the person who receives the ciphertext and they want to decrypt? They receive that ciphertext 11111. And again, assume they know the key. So which key do they use first to decrypt? You would use K2. That's shown here where we encrypt using K1 and K2. To decrypt, we take the ciphertext and decrypt using K2 and then K1. Let's do that. So we just did the step of what the normal would user would do to encrypt. Now let's do the step of what the receiver would do to decrypt. We take the receive ciphertext. We know the key. K2 is the same as the original value. If you look up the tables, can someone look it up? You have it in front of you. I don't. Decrypt one 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 five ones with key one zero zero. What do you get? Decrypt. Be careful, decrypt. Let me bring up the table. Wrong one. This table. We have the ciphertext of all ones using the key 100. Zero, 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 zero. This column, look for the ciphertext. Where is it? You can see it, I cannot. Is it down or up? Up, up there, we found it. OK, so the decrypting going backwards, remember. So be careful there. So if we had the ciphertext, five ones, we use this key 100, zero, zero, the plain text, the result of decryption, 00111. One, one. This intermediate value, x. Then we decrypt that. We take that x value, 
and use K1 and look it up. So the column for K1, 001, the input is 00111. What do we get out? You should get that value. If not, something's gone wrong. What's the point? This is what the encryptor does when they know the key. They get an intermediate value, this x here. And the decryptor, when they also know the key, they get an intermediate value. It is the same. It must be the same. Okay, so that's what the meet-in-the-middle attack takes advantage of. That if you go from one direction in one step, you get this intermediate value x. If you decrypt also for the ciphertext using the other key, you also get the exact same value of x. So that's just showing that this intermediate value, when we encrypt or decrypt, is always the same. You can try it with other pairs of plain text ciphertext. So what the attack does then is finds the values of x which are the same because of those one of them must be the correct one the one which uses the correct values of k1 and k2 it turns out there may be more than one as we saw we got three so when there's more than one what we need to do is try another pair on just those three and the one that produces the correct ciphertext given those three possible keys is tells us the correct key and the point was to cut down on the number of operations to make the attack faster. And we tried to count in this case. In the first step, we encrypted 2 to the power of 3 times, 2 to the power of 3 operations. That is for all possible keys. In the second step, we went through and did another 2 to the power of 3 possible operations, in this case, decrypt operations. And there were a couple more steps down the uh, down the bottom, I think three more, or actually six more attempts of just confirming those keys. Another six operations. So in our example, we went through two to the power of three, plus two to the power of three, plus another six operations, totaling 22. Brute force, if we did it that way, would have took us 64 operations. So yes, our attack is faster. If we extend that concept to deaths, double deaths would take 2 to the power of 112 if we did brute force. Using the meet in the middle attack, it turns out that it's approximately 2 to the power of 56 for the first set of encryptions, 2 to the power of 56 for the second, plus a few more. And the few more that we need to do is very, very small compared to 2 to the power of 56. So in fact, it's very small, this plus a few more here. So we uh, typically approximate that to 2 to the power of 56 plus 2 to the power of 56, 2 to the power of 57. That is, using the meet in the middle attack, the number of operations an attacker needs to break this cipher is about double what is needed for single deaths. Single deaths is 2 to the power of 56. Meet in the middle attack on double deaths is 2 to the power of 57. Doubling is not a good improvement in security. It just doubles the cost, which is usually trivial to make up. So the meet in the middle attack, because of that, double deaths is not much stronger than single deaths. So it doesn't gain us much. There are some details which we will not try to uh, explain too much. Um, with double, double deaths, it turns out you don't have to do all of these decryptions in, in some cases. As soon as you find a match, you may try it on a second pair. And if you get a second match, then you assume it's the right key. That is, there are ways to optimise. But Normally you need to do 2 to the power of 56 operations and up to another 2 to the power of 56. So we say it's about 
twice as good as single deaths, which is not very good at all. So this is an example of, an, a, a, of cryptanalysis. It's not brute force, it's Im improved upon brute force. What are the problems with this attack? Compared to brute force, what? it's faster than brute force, but what are the negatives? No, what, what, so the attack, if we do the attack, we'll get to the solution before than using brute force. So that's a good thing, but there are some problems with this attack. We need, we need the pair of plain text cipher text. So in our attack, in our simpler case, case, we had P1C1, so the attacker needed to know that first pair and in fact the second pair. And in real attacks on DES, double DES, Again, generally the attacker needs to know two pairs of plaintext ciphertext. So this is a known plaintext attack, so the attacker needs to know a little bit more information than normal. But knowing two pairs is not too hard, in fact. Okay, so that's one minor thing, but in practice it's not a big issue. What else is a, a problem with this attack? So we care about the speed. This one was faster than brute force. We care about what the attacker needs to know. This one required the attacker to know two pairs, which is not a big problem in most cases. And we care about one more thing when we're doing an attack. Can anyone see what's the problem here? The other thing is memory or storage. When doing the attack, in our case, the attacker stored or calculated eight values of x. Then what they do is they go in the decrypt operation going from the ciphertext C1 and decrypting and really what they can do is compare these values they get with this existing eight values. To do that, we must store these eight values. So what we do is that we find this value of x, x21, compare it to our eight values. If it matches, then keep note of that. If not, try the next one and so on. So the problem with this attack is we need to store at least these eight values. In DES, how many values do we need to store? Here we need to store two to the power of three values of five bits long in DES. 2 to the power of 56 values of 64 bits long, or 8 bytes. 2 to the power of 56 times 8 bytes is how much storage space we need. How many terabytes? I think it's about 500,000 terabytes are needed. Okay, so the storage is the trade-off that we make in this attack. It's faster, assuming we have a large space to store it. There are some ways to get around that, the trade-off, that make it slower but use less storage. But in general with any crypt, crypt analysis, the attacks consider those three uh, performance metrics. Speed, you want the attack to be fast. Known information, we'd like the attack to be successful without the attacker knowing any extra information. In this case we needed to know an extra pair or two pairs of plain text ciphertext, and memory. That is how much we need to store when we're performing the attack. In a brute force attack, storage is almost zero. We just do it and throw away the old values. In this attack, storage requirements are on the order of 2 to the power of 56, which is quite large in practice. So when people compare different attacks and compare ciphers, they usually compare by those three metrics. And that finishes our analysis of the meet in the middle attack. Questions on our example before we return to our slides? There have been quiz questions, exam questions about perform a meet in the middle attack on some simple cipher. 
Okay, so given that table you have in front of you or a smaller table, go through the steps of, okay, encrypt the known plain text and then start decrypting the known corresponding cipher text and see when you get a match. This, the slides, uh, this explains the algorithm. Okay, so we've gone through the example of applying this meet in the middle attack. So this just explains the algorithm for double deaths. You need about, well, you need normally two known plain text ciphertext pairs. If you have two, then that's with very high probability enough to be successful with it with the attack it requires about twice as many operations as single deaths but a lot more memory so how do we improve not double deaths triple deaths and there are variations of triple deaths the one we see here triple in terms of three operations Take our plain text, encrypt, take the intermediate value, say A, decrypt. It could have been encrypt here as well. We'll explain why it's D, but it, apply the operation again and get an intermediate value B and apply the operation again and you get the ciphertext. And to decrypt, you go the same operations, but you use the keys in an opposite order. So apply three operations of DES instead of two. This is called triple DES or triple encryption. There are some variations of it. You can either use two keys, like in this picture, K1 and K2, and in the second operation use K1 again. Gives us an effective key size of 112 bits. So two DES keys we mean here. Or you can use three different keys, not shown, but it would be K1, K2, K3. 3 by 56 is 168 bits. So there were two, two options that you could choose from, depending upon what key length you wanted. And it is not subject to the exact same meet in the middle attack because you see there's no, if we take our known plain text, we get some intermediate value A. If we take the corresponding known ciphertext and decrypt, we get a different intermediate value B, whereas with double deaths, they were the same, the same values of X. So there are extensions of the meet in the middle attack, but it's, uh, it improves the security significantly. And it's commonly used, and or commonly was used. It's maybe still available today, but there are considered better alternatives. It could have been E, 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 encrypt, encrypt, encrypt. But in practice, sometimes it's used encrypt, decrypt, encrypt, just so it's compatible with single deaths. To get single deaths out of this, just use the same key. Encrypt with key one, decrypt with key one, and you get your original plain text. Encrypt with key one, and you get the same output as if you use single deaths. So it's just a compatibility feature to have encrypt, decrypt, encrypt. It could have been encrypt, encrypt, encrypt as well. So triple DES is considered uh, secure nowadays. What's the problem with triple DES? Speed. It's three times slower than single DES. And in fact, single DES wasn't designed for some hardware uh, and software systems, so single DES was not very fast uh, compared to other ciphers. So this is three times slower than single deaths. And the NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US in the 1990s started to develop a new standard for encryption and they had some really competition where different researchers submitted their algorithms for this new standard and uh, one called Rhinedale was chosen as the winner in 2001 and that's called the Advanced Encryption Standard, AES. And this is widely used today. Many of the, the software that you use to encrypt is likely using AES. 
it uses a block size of 128 bits. DES used 64-bit blocks. This uses 128 bits. It allows three different key sizes. So depending on what security you want, you want normal, 128 bits. You want uh, ultra paranoid, 256 bits. Okay. And relating to the key, it uses different rounds. We'll not go through the operation, but it uses rounds in the same way as DES. And it uses S boxes, exclusive OR, and some other operations to do the encryption. Very widely used, generally considered secure today, no known attacks. But we will not go through the details. We've gone th enough through, through DES as, as one example of a real block cipher. And there are others. Okay, so this lists some names of some common ones you may come across if you use, see different encryption software. So others, and they differ maybe in terms of the blocks that they operate on, usually 64 or 128 bits. The key sizes they accept and the design of approach. Feistel structure was what DES used. Some use a slightly different approach. But there are others, and they have advantages and disadvantages, like speed, uh, whether they are restrictions on, on patents and, and being able to implement, and uh, some security advantages. What we want to finish this topic on is some further analysis of brute force attacks and other types of attacks. But before we do so, let's, let's encrypt something just to show you in practice what happens. I'm going to use some software just to encrypt a file, just to, to illustrate, and then we'll use that same software to, uh, to give some indicator of the speed it takes, to, or the time it takes to encrypt. With brute force attacks, the time it takes to do a brute force attack depends upon two things. How many keys you need to try and how long it takes to try one key, which is really your computer speed. So we'll do some encryption. I'll just demonstrate some quick encryption and then we'll give a, uh, an indicator of how long it, say, takes my computer to encrypt or decrypt and then generalize that to other systems. The instructions or the commands I'm going to go through, you have, again, I hope, in one of the printouts. And it's on a website if you want to look. Uh, it's called Demo of Symmetric Key Encryption using OpenSSL. You may have to keep scrolling through. Forward. I hope so. Go back. Is there another one? Maybe. Anyone find it? There's another printout in there that is called Simple Example of. Maybe I included a different one. You might be okay. If it's not there, then you have one which is maybe just. You have this one Simple Introduction to Using OpenSSL on the Command Line. Okay, S two slightly different ones. Uh, OpenSSL is some encryption software. It is primarily used as a library by other software to do encryption. That is, it provides a set of uh, encryption operations and other security operations. And when you write your software, you can include the OpenSSL library so you don't need to encrypt or you don't need to implement your own encryption. You just use OpenSSL. It can also be used as a standalone program to encrypt things. And that's what I'll use just to demonstrate. Uh, there are other libraries. This is just one that's widely used. But don't worry too much about uh, following on in your notes. I'll just demonstrate and just uh, you'll have a chance as one of your homeworks to do this yourself. 
Let's do some symmetric key encryption first. First, I'm going to get some plain text. And I'm going to copy and paste some of the commands to save on typing. Uh, here's my plain text message I'm going to encrypt. So my file, I just have a, a message in a file. We'll actually encrypt the file, which is encrypting the contents of the file. How big is the, the plain text? The plain text is 72 bytes. Okay. We're going to use DES to encrypt. How many blocks do we have? Remember, DES operates on a block at a time. How many blocks? What's the block size used by DES? DES uses 64 bits at a time. So 64 bits is equivalent to 8 bytes. We have 72 bytes to encrypt, so we have 9 blocks to encrypt. Okay, so our plain text is 9 blocks long. So the the normal, or not the normal way, the, the, the basic way to apply our encryption cipher when we have an input which is larger than the block size is to encrypt one block, get some cipher text, encrypt the next block, get some cipher text, and at the end, those output cipher text values just join them together, concatenate them together to get the resulting cipher text. To visualize that, What we're going to do is we have our, our plain text, P, as input, and we can think P is broken into nine blocks. P1 concatenated with P2, concatenated with P3. The double bars here means concatenation or joined, and we keep going, and up to P9 in our example. Nine blocks of 64 bits. Remember, DES takes 64 bits at a time, or eight bytes. We're going to use DES. Sixty-four bits per block. So the way that we'll encrypt this nine blocks is that we'll apply DES on, we'll have a key. We'll apply DES using that key as an input and the plain text P1 as an input and we'll get C1 as output. So this is the encryption block. And then what we do is we use the same key with the second block of plain text. Encrypt with DES again, we'll get C2 as output, and what comes in here is the same key. And we do that for each of our nine blocks of plain text input, and we'll get nine blocks of ciphertext out. And in this simple example, which we'll use, we'll just concatenate the nine blocks of ciphertext. Join them together. And that will be our resulting ciphertext. There are other ways to combine the, uh, the outputs of the encryption for each input plain text block. And we'll see them in the next topic. They're called modes of operation. This is the basic one, but there are, we'll see this has a flaw in a moment. So we, the ciphertext is made up of nine blocks of, 
component ciphertext. <coughs> We can look at the plain text before we encrypt it, just to compare. How do we convert our plain text to an input that DES will support? DES takes 64 bits. What do we have as plain text? Some English letters. How do we convert them? What's the name of the system we use to convert English letters or any? letters usually to, or English letters to bits. ASCII, okay, so the ASCII encoding tells us that usually each English letter is mapped to a 8-bit value, one byte per letter. But remember, DES just treats it as a sequence of bits. It doesn't understand that they're letters. XXD just shows us that plain text, but in this case in hexadecimal form. So the letter H corresponding, corresponds to, what, 4.8 in hexadecimal, or even in binary we can have a look. It doesn't fit so well. Zoom out again. There we go. There's the binary that we're going to encrypt. Okay. So from DES's perspective, the first eight bits, which represent in our case the uppercase H, are these eight bits. Which is whatever it is, 172 or something. And then we need to, so DES will take each block of 64 bits, encrypt, and produce 64 bits as output. And we'll have a look in a moment. With DES, we need, of course, the plain text as input, and what else do we need as input? A key. How am I going to choose a key? It should be random. Okay, we shouldn't just choose our favourite number and convert it to binary. We should choose a random key. So we need a random number generator. And we'll see in one of the later topics, generating random numbers is not easy as well. Of course, we've got software to do it, but some software is better than others. I'm also going to use OpenSSL to generate a random 8-byte value. I'll do it in hex. There's our key, but in hexadecimal. Remember, DES takes a 64-bit key. Although it only uses 56 bits, we still need the 64 bits. The other 8 bits are used for a parity check. But we need a 64-bit input. So I generated an 8-byte random number, but instead of printing it in binary, I printed it in hex, because we can use that uh, and the software will convert the hexadecimal value to binary. There's my key. To do this joining of the ciphertext blocks together, we use what's called a mode of operation. And that's our next topic. And we'll see when we get to that next topic that that mode usually has an extra parameter, something that initializes these steps a vector that initializes it, called an IV, an initialization vector. And we'll discuss that later when we look at modes of operation, but for this encryption we need to specify what value we'll use. And we'll use a random value. So I'm going to generate a second random number. The first one is my key, the second one is what we'll call the initialization vector to initialize the, the combining of the blocks. It becomes important with other algorithms. Now let's encrypt. OpenSSL is the software. The function we're going to use is encrypt. And we're going to specify the algorithm. DES. And we specify the mode in which we'll use this algorithm. 
And again, this is a bit uh, ahead of the next topic, but the mode we are going to use is the simplest mode called electronic code book. We'll come back to that. It's this, this mode of concatenate the ciphertext on output. That's all it means. Minus E for encrypt. If we wanted to decrypt, we'd do the same, but minus D. Our input is the plain text file. The output, let's call it something. some ciphertext file and we need two other inputs minus K for the key so I'll just copy and paste so we have a key as input as well as an initialization vector this second random number so again you don't need to be aware, know them yet, but ECB and the initialization vector come up in the next topic. IV uh, initializes the, the algorithm that, that specifies how to combine each block when we encrypt the input plaintext blocks. In this case, it's very simple. How to combine is just concatenate. But in other more secure algorithms, the way to combine the output of encrypting each plaintext uh, requires some initialization to get started, some first value. It's not needed in this case, but we, we must specify it for the, for the software to work. It'll make more sense in the next topic. Usually when we encrypt something, the software will add some padding if necessary. And the padding has two purposes. The padding is to fill out the plain text to be the right size with respect to the blocks. In our case, we're OK. We've got exactly a multiple of 64 bits in our plain text. But of course, you may have a plain text which is not an exactly a multiple of 64 bits, so padding would add some uh, characters at the end. Padding can also be used to introduce some error checking. So we can add an error detection code inside such that when we decrypt, we can automatically check if what we obtain is correct or not. To avoid all that detail, I'm going to say no padding. Usually we would not use that, but we'll see why it's useful in a moment. That's it. Seems complex, but specify that we want to use DES encrypt our plain text, obtain some cipher text using this key, this random key, and we do it, and it's done. The cipher text file, the output, is also 72 bytes. That's what we expect. 72 bytes in, 72 bytes out. Let's have a look at the ciphertext. What do you expect to see? Random. There it is. You can look at the hexadecimal okay, and see if you see any pattern in here. Or look at the ASCII representation. Where it has a dot, it means it's a non-printable character. Of the ASCII characters, some are not printable, such as the control characters. Okay, you cannot print a control character in a single character. Delete, for example. How do you print delete? So it's random. There's our ciphertext. All right. Uh, hopefully, DES did what we expected there. It encrypted and produced our nine blocks of ciphertext and joined them together. Is it random? Look closely. That's a hint that it's not random. Where's the, the pattern if it's not random? Look at the rows, maybe a further hint. So we said that there were nine blocks of 64 bits or of eight bytes, eight bytes, two hexadecimal digits is one byte. So in fact, it turns out one row is one block. 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bytes. Two hex digits is one byte. So this first row represents the first block that comes out, C1. The second row is C2. And the last row is C9. The first characters here just tell us uh, the, the position. It's not a part of the output, it's just showing the position. Can anyone see the pattern? Yes, good. Can you show me the pattern or tell me where it is? 6FE80BC6. Here, the fourth row, and in the seventh row, 6FE80BC6. If you look at those values, within them they appear random. There's no pattern there. But now we compare it to this seventh block and we see it's exactly the same. That's very, 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 very unlikely if you have random characters here. So that is a pattern. And that is a problem. Any ciphertext that contains a pattern that we can easily recognize means that it has a weakness in that it gives the attacker a chance to uh, use that pattern to work out some structure in the plain text. We'd like the output ciphertext to be completely random. What is our weakness here? That's the question. Anyone? DES works. OK, the algorithm DES is secure. OK, all right. Brute force attack, it's subject to. But in terms of producing random output, it works. So if we looked at one block of output, look at those bits, and they are effectively random. Let's show you the input plain text again. Can you see? Look at those corresponding rows of the plain text and the cipher text. With the plain text, the fourth row was the text space secret space. That was our part of our message. And the seventh row was the same. And as a result, in binary or hexadecimal, we have the same input block. P4 is the same as P7. The result, remember all we did is we took P4, encrypt it using one key and get C4. P7, encrypt using the same key and we'll get C7. When the two keys are the same and the two input blocks are the same, then the two output blocks will be the same. And that's what we see in the ciphertext. The fourth output ciphertext block and the seventh output ciphertext block are the same. This is the weakness is in this way that we combine the output blocks. We just concatenate them together. It's called the mode of operation. This one is very simple. We just combine them as is. And that reveals a weakness in this approach. If we do that, we can get still patterns in the overall output ciphertext. The DES algorithm is secure, but the way that we combine the blocks is not secure. So what we need is another way to combine blocks such that even if the input blocks repeat, sorry, wrong place, even if we have secret and secret as two different or two input blocks, uh, the same input plain text, we need to get output ciphertext which is different. And that's what we call a mode of operation, the way to do that across multiple blocks. This mode of operation is insecure, very easy but insecure. We will just complete, we'll, inc we'll decrypt. And I'm just going to copy and paste the command because it's very similar to decrypt. We just change E to D 
and of course re reverse our input and output. And I'll call the output receive.txt. So this is the receiver. They get the ciphertext as input. They must know the key, the same key as used for encrypting. They must know the initialization vector as well. And they will decrypt. And we'll just look at the received file. And it's the same as our uh, original plain text. So the decryption works in this case. If we decrypted with the wrong key, instead of 5.4 at the end, say 5.3, and we look at the output I'll use XXD to show the hexadecimal form so receive 2 is what if someone received the ciphertext encrypted with one key and then we try to decrypt it with a different key the wrong key what do we expect? we'd expect random unrecognizable output in this case and in indeed it is in this case that using the wrong key even though the key differed by what just one bit in fact four became three the key was very similar the output is completely different random using the wrong key will give us the wrong output and recognizably wrong in this case we see it's not English message So OpenSSL will, will have a few homework tasks which require you uh, to use that. Uh, not too hard, I'll give you the commands, but just to generate some, uh, to, to encrypt some, some messages and to later generate some keys for public key cryptography. So let's, let's talk about the modes of operation because I think we can do some of them quite quickly and then in the last five or ten minutes we'll come back to the, the speed of encrypting and brute force attacks. So we'll come back to this this slide uh, just towards the end I think. Actually, I changed my mind. Let's stay on this slide. Finish it, because uh, late on Tuesday afternoon, let's stay with the simple stuff. This last slide here uh, compares some attacks on block ciphers. And really, to measure attacks with respect to speed, we need to know how many operations we need to apply to perform the attack and how long it takes to apply an operation. How long does it take to encrypt something or decrypt? I'll decrypt again. You see how long it takes. It's basically instantaneous. We cannot measure it easily here. So we'd like to know how long does it take a computer to encrypt or decrypt? In most algorithms, that with symmetric key algorithms, encryption and decryption take about the same time. They're very similar in the operation. OpenSSL has its inbuilt speed test where it will take an algorithm and do many encryptions over a period of time and tell us some, some results of how long it took. I hope I've got it right, wrong. Again, OpenSSL speed test on DES. What it does is it tries DES uh, for three seconds at a time on different size input blocks. So the first thing it did was for three seconds it encrypted random inputs. Each input was 16 blocks. I'll stop it there. It keeps going for a while and just explain. For three seconds 
It uses DES. And in this case, it didn't use ECB. It used another mode, CBC, just a, a more secure one than ECB, much more common. And it encrypted random blocks. Each was 16 bytes long. Our use of DES, we encrypted a 72-byte uh, input. In this case, it's encrypting 16-byte inputs. And it measured how many it could do. It did, what's that, about 10 million, 9.6 million encrypt operations in three seconds. So that's about, in, in one second, about 3 million or 3.2 million encrypts per second. So that's just a quick indicator of how fast my computer can encrypt. And we could do, on different length inputs, we could see also how long it takes. Basically, it's a, a linear in that if you double the length of the input, you'll double the time it takes to encrypt. So in this case, with a small block, I can do about 3 million, a little bit more than 3 million DES operations per second. If I left that running, it would show me some summary statistics, but we don't need that. Just about 3 million per second. How long will a brute force attack on DES take me? On my computer, just my laptop, let's approximate 3 million per second. How many keys do I need to try? With DES, single DES, 2 to the power of 56 in the worst case. That many keys. But I can do 3 million per second. So the number of seconds is that many. So that's how many seconds it will take. We can convert to minutes, divide by 60, divert, convert to hours, convert to days, convert to years. 760 years it would take my laptop to break deaths. Okay, so when we say that DES is subject to a brute force attack, well, maybe not on your computer. You'd need a lot more resources than a single computer. Or, and we'll show an example, or some dedicated hardware that's built just for doing brute force attacks on DES. So my CPU in my laptop is built for doing general purpose operations. You could build hardware that is just uh, tailored to do DES decryptions. What about AES? AES is considered a, uh, a secure algorithm today. We'll do a quick speed test. And with AES, you can choose from different key lengths. 128 bits is the, the lowest, the smallest key length. And we, again, have modes of operation. CBC is one of them. So AES is a different cipher. We'll just do a few, or well, the first. And we'll stop it there. On our same size input, with AES, I got, what's that? 11 million operations in three seconds. So it's slightly faster than DES. DES was about 9 million per three seconds. Here we've got 11, so almost 4 million per second. This is a 128-bit key. So I could get my calculator and try 2 to the power of 128 divided by 4 million per second and see how many centuries it would take me. But it turns out nowadays your CPU has some instructions built in that it's tailored just for AES. So most C CPUs today have some, so if you think of the instructions that are uh, available on the CPU, there are some that are just for encrypting with AES. 
So what we can do is we can try and use those instructions. Currently, it's doing it all in software. So all the encryption is performed in software, but I can tell OpenSSL to try and use some of the hardware capabilities and see if it's faster. And it's the same, but I add a, need to add an option. It doesn't matter what it is. EVP, I found out what it is. This will tell my computer, or tell OpenSSL, don't try and do everything in software. Try to use some of the special features of the CPU that provide AES encryption. And it's only for AES. Let's hope it's faster. Was it? That's 68 million. OK, so that's six or seven times faster, or six times faster than just using the, the standard operations of the CPU. So you can build your hardware that is dedicated for encrypting, and you can get a, a, an increase, a large increase in speed. So CPUs today include AES operations. So this went from 11 million in three seconds to 68 million in three seconds. Still, with 128 bits, 68 million in three seconds is about 22 million per second. Two to the power of 128. Seconds to minutes to hours to days to years. That's the number of years it would take my computer to do a brute force on AES with 128-bit key. AES, the key length of 128 bits is considered not subject to a brute force attack. So it's much more secure than the, the, the key length of 128 bits is considered sufficient for most practical reasons. Uh, so yes, much more secure than DES, which only has a 56-bit key. It's to do with the key, key length in this case not the algorithm. What this table summarizes is some comparison between several different algorithms, DES, triple DES, and AES with two different key lengths. Remember when we compare attacks, there's either brute force, which purely depends upon the key length, and cryptanalysis, which uses or tries to find some weakness in the cipher to do an attack, like our meet in the middle attack. And in that case, we make a trade-off. Cryptanalysis tries to reduce the time it takes to do an attack, but at the expense usually of either having more memory and or requiring more known information. And that's what this table lists. The way to read it is that with DES, the best known method on single DES is brute force attack. There are no uh, significantly faster attacks. And the key space, with 56-bit key, the key space is 2 to the power of 56. So the time measured in number of operations is 2 to the power of 56. So we don't give an absolute time in seconds. We measure it in the number of operations or order of magnitude. Of course, the time depends upon your computer speed. If we had my laptop, it was 700 years. If we had 100 PCs, then we could increase the speed at which we decrypt and reduce the time. With triple DES, the man in the middle attack is possible, but it's uh, not as successful as on, sync on double DES. And it there's a man in the middle, sorry, meet in the middle attack on triple DES. If we have a key of 168 bits, it reduces the time down to effectively trying 111 bits. Remember, with double DES, we had a key of 112, but the meet in the middle attack reduced the time to about equivalent to 57, 2 to the power of 57. And the same concept applies here. 
But to do that attack, you need a large amount of memory. 2 to the power of 56 is the order of magnitude for the memory. And you need some known data, not much in this case. There's another attack by uh, some person called Lux on triple deaths, which takes slightly longer than the meat in the middle attack, four times longer. It requires more memory and it requires much more known data. Okay, so just examples of two different attacks in this case. With respect to AES, there's some known attacks in theory. With AES, 128-bit key, brute force would take 2 to the power of 128 operations. This attack, by clique attack, takes equivalent of 2 to the power of 126.1 operations. Again, about four times faster. So instead of my billions and billions of centuries, it's divided by four. But this attack requires some memory and a lot of known data. It requires the attacker to know 2 to the power of 88 combinations of plaintext ciphertext pairs, which is practically impossible to know. And similar for AES-256. So when people analyze the strength of algorithms, they usually compare them on those three metrics. Time, memory required to do the attack, and the amount of data that is known by the attacker in advance. Questions on that slide before we have one last example? How am I going to speed up? This was my computer. This is the number of years it takes to break AES-128. How am I going to speed it up? Sorry? Use more computers. Because on a, an attack on a key, we can try them in parallel. On one computer, I can try and decrypt some set of the keys. On another computer, the other set of key keys. So we can parallelize this problem. Therefore, the more computers, you the less time. So yes, I could get the what, 100 or 200 lab computers here at SIT and, and run my attack on them. And I re reduce this time by a factor of 100, but still not possible to break. What else? More computers or faster computers? I just use my laptop maybe get some hardware which is dedicated to breaking AES. And these last few slides, the last 10 minutes, give some examples of attacks on both DES and AES. Again, you have these slides there. Uh, <clears throat> so we'll first look at DES. Remember DES, 56 bits. In 1998, the EFF developed some hardware that did break DES. So that's... Uh, what, 17, is it 17 years ago, they developed hardware which cost less than 250,000 US at that time, and it could do about 80 billion keys per second. My laptop did it, what, two or, or three million keys per second. My laptop did three million per second. This hardware, 17 years ago, could do 80 billion keys per second. So you can imagine if there was dedicated hardware today, it could be much faster. So in that time, it solved deaths. That is, it found a key in 56 hours. So although my laptop cannot break deaths, today it's uh, not hard to find hardware that will. In 2006, uh, a company 
tried to improve upon this, or this was one of the attempts. So what they did is they used FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays, so some dedicated hardware that they, they programmed, designed and programmed just for breaking desks. And they had a, uh, basically they had a product. It had 128 FPGAs, so this picture shows how many there are there, uh, 16 or 20 FPGAs. They had a total of 120. And per FPGA, they could do 400 million keys per second. So times that by 120. And they could break deaths in nine days about, and it only cost $10,000. Okay, so the cost comes down. At that same time, in 2006, a typical CPU was a Pentium 4, which could do about 2 million keys per second. Okay. What about today? Well, my slides haven't been updated for one, one year at least. 2013, it's not much different this year. How fast do computers increase? Well, Moore's law is one measure that says that, so Gordon Moore come up with this rule that the number of transistors we can put on a CPU doubles every about 18 months, one and a half years. Now, it's not perfect, but let's use that as a guide saying that every one and a half years, the speed of our computers double. So I buy a computer today, I buy a computer in one and a half years' time, it will be twice as fast as today's computer. Or the other way, I buy a computer today, I spend the same amount, no, I buy the same power computer in one and a half years, it should be half the price as today. If the speed doubles, we can get the equivalent speed for half the price. That's what we'll use as a, a rough guide. If you use that as a rough guide, then you could calculate that deaths would take about $300 US to break. That was it last year, or 2013. So assuming you can halve the cost of hardware every one and a half years for the same speed, you can cut it down to a manageable price. So DES is breakable. What about AES? So this same company that built one of the previous products applied similar approaches for AES. They had some hardware that had 128 FPGAs programmed just to break AES, so to do AES encryptions and decryptions fast. It cost about $100 per FPGA. It could do 500 million keys per second. They also had some power measurements. And if we apply those numbers, Using a brute force attack, it could do 500 million keys per second. Using a, another cryptanalysis attack, almost a billion keys per second. Brute force of AES, 2 to the power of 128 keys. So using their hardware, it costs about $15,000 US, and you can do about 64 billion keys per second. So expanding that, well, for $15,000, it would take you 10 to the power of 20 years using that hardware. If you had more money, you could buy more of those devices. If you had $15 million, you could buy 1,000 of those devices. And therefore, you reduce the, the time by a factor of 1,000. Factor of 1,000 takes us from 10 to the power of 20 down to the 10 to the power of 17 years. If you had a 15 billion dollars, it's down to 10 to the power of 14 years. So still, with 15 billion dollars, so this is just some rough calculations, still takes you 10 to the power of 14 years to brute force AES. And it's not much different if you use the more advanced attack. Okay. It's still approximately the same. So even today, if you have uh, essentially all the money in the world to buy all the computer resources you can, you're not going to break AES 128. What if we want to encrypt something today with AES 128 
and I want it to be safe for the next 15 years. I don't want someone in 15 years' time to be able to decrypt it. Okay? I encrypt today with AES-128. In 15 years' time, someone finds my file. I still don't want them to be able to decrypt it. So let's predict. Again, assuming that we can halve the cost every one and a half years, in 15 years time, that's a factor of, that's 10 times we can halve the cost. Effectively, we can reduce it to, by a factor of 1,000 in 15 years. That is, if you had $15 billion to spend in 15 years' time, you could break AES-128 in 100 billion years. If you use AES-256 today, it would take someone 10 to the power of 49 years. So this is demonstrating that brute force attacks, no matter how fast your computer, are not possible. Okay.